Welcome everyone to tonight's Elijah Audubon uh, Society evening program. Tonight's program is an introduction into fireflies, their diversity, natural history, and life cycle um, by, uh, from uh, Oliver Keller. Um, first, a uh, few now announcements before um, I introduce um, Oliver and um, then I will hand it off. Um, keep in mind, uh, uh, I've mute, uh, everyone is muted. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, please hold them until the end. You can also type them into the chat box. Um, tonight's presentation will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube, uh, to our, you know, and to our social media. Um, so if you have, again, if you have any questions, chat box or ask them at the end. Um, and now I'll, uh, just a few quick announcements before we get this started. Um, uh, for Santa Fe College birding classes, uh, registration is open now for the upcoming five-week class. Um, the Saturday morning classes begin on April 9th, and they go from 7.45 a.m. to 10 a.m. And there are a few spots open, um, but if you want to get uh, into those uh, awesome, you know, like the continuing education type um, Santa Fe College birding classes, anyone can sign up for these classes. Um, you don't have to be a student at Santa Fe or any other college, um, but only a few spots left for those. Um, Pines and Predators is this Saturday at First Magnitude, uh, First Magnitude Brewery from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, it's an educational festival and fundraiser for local wildlife rehabilitators featuring live birds of prey, creatures of the night, and more. So um, the, uh, those events are uh, on our, posted on our website and our social media. Um, coming up Friday night from 6 to 10 at First Magnitude is a, also another event. Um, for the birds, extra pale ale beer release, and part of their proceeds from the sale of For the Birds uh, benefits local nonprofit organizations associated with wildlife conservation. Um, so, presentation will have presentations by Avian Research Conservation Institute and Jack Davis, who is a Pulitzer Prize-winning author of *The Bald Eagle: The Improbable Journey of America's Bird*. Immediately following that presentation, uh, Jack Davis will be signing copies of his new book um, there at First Magnitude. Again, that's from Friday night, this Friday night from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, and also we'll need, uh, volunteers are needed to help Elijah Audubon staff our educational booth at uh, upcoming festivals. Um, so please contact us. Um, uh, if you, uh, you can contact us on, you know, either through social media or email, um, ask, any one, ask any one of us on the board. Um, so, um, and if you're interested, um, we can send you the upcoming festival dates. Uh, so please, if you are interested in helping out uh, for that, you know, for that Pints and Predators uh, from 10 to 3 um, or other other stuff, um, please give us a, um, um, please contact us so we can get you uh, connected with those opportunities to volunteer. And finally, um, Wednesday Bird Walks at uh, Sweetwater Wetlands Park uh, will continue every Wednesday morning um, at 8, beginning at 8.30, which we generally step off at 8.30 a.m., um, and those will continue through the end of May. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, Oliver Keller and we'll um, get started with the presentation. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, Dr. Oliver Keller earned his PhD from the University of Florida uh, where he studied fireflies of the West Indies. Um, the West Indies are a biodiversity hotspot home to almost 10% of the world's firefly species. So currently he's working as a biological scientist in the Florida State Collection of Arthropods um, for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and continuing his research on fireflies. So his presentation is gonna include an introduction into, into fireflies, their diversity, natural history and life cycle. And he's then gonna cover the firefly diversity of Florida, where to find them, the consequences of light pollution and tips and tricks to help preserve their habitat. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'll hand it off to Oliver. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Um, let me share my screen here. Share. Can everybody see that? Okay. Can you see that? Um, okay. That's good. So I'm going to talk today about the fireflies of Florida. Um, a little bit about where to find them. Um, we have a lot of species. And but I will start. First, with my educational background. So I got my bachelor's degree at Saginaw Valley uh, State University in Michigan, where I did study like general um, 
Beatles. Um, not, I wasn't really specialized yet uh, with under my advisor there. But then I transferred to w, uh, Wichita State University in Kansas. And there I started studying Beatles, um, in particular Scarab Beatles from California. And after receiving my master's, I then transferred to the University of Florida, where I then uh, transferred into Fireflies, and uh, specifically um, Fireflies of the West Indies, which is a Firefly biodiversity hotspot, or it's actually a biodiversity hotspot for pretty much anything, uh, all the animals, all the plants. Um, there's a lot of endemism on these islands. And so there's 186 species of fireflies in 19 genera in, on the islands of the West Indies, which include the Bahamas, uh, the um, Greater Antilles, like Cuba, Hispaniola, and then the Lesser Antilles all the way down to uh, Grenada. And that is, when we, get, when we get to Florida fireflies, you will see that is a lot of species because the land area of those islands is just marginally bigger than that of Florida, but they have about three times as many fireflies that are known. And there's over 80 undescribed species of fireflies just on Hispaniola alone that we found in museum collections. Um, on the bottom there, you see a little uh, tidbit of an article that I published in 2021. Uh, which is a catalog of these fireflies of the ranch in these, which I published to establish like a baseline what's actually there. So uh, people that want to study these fireflies can actually just look in there, get all the information about all the publications and then continue their um, studies or start their studies on any particular group of those fireflies. These are just a few pictures that I took while I studied um, fireflies on Hispaniola and on uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, the one on the top is a larvae that is undescribed. The adults are described, but the larvae had, uh, had never been described. And I, it's very um, rarely collected. It's from Puerto Rico. It's, um, the name is Pyrectomina galeata. Um, it's a very um, bright, the larvae are very bright when they uh, glow at night. Um, that's how I actually also found them. I was walking through these grasslands and I saw all these lights on the, on the grasses. So I went looking and then find, found all these larvae. And the other one on the bottom left here, the green one, is one of the, I think, only four species of green fireflies currently known in the world. And when you look at them, in a museum or so, you wouldn't know they're green because the, the color fades really badly. Um, and then on the right, that's a firefly species that's endemic to um, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. And it's very, I mean, it's one of the prettiest fireflies I've seen so far collecting. Um, so currently then I started working about a year ago for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, um, the Department of Plant Industries here in um, Gainesville. And what maybe a few of you know is that we also house the Florida State Collection of Arthropods, which is one of the most important uh, invertebrate collections in the Southeast. We have about 10 million curated specimens currently in the collection, which uh, from coleoptera, uh, from beetles to flies to uh, true bugs, um, Hymenoptera, uh, so bees and wasps and ants. And um, we also have probably several million specimens that are still in alcohol or in um, other media that need uh, to be curated and need to be integrated into the collection. And on the bottom right there, you see a drawer that is full of um, Futinus fireflies. And a lot of them in our collection are also from Florida. So that's a uh, pretty good. Um, you can see we have a lot of um, insects and we have about, I would say eight to 9,000 um, firefly uh, specimens that are already curated. And there I um, take care of parts of the collection, uh, making sure that they're maintained and that, they, that the collection grows because it's very, the collection is very important for um, the Florida Department of Agriculture because we use it as a resource to identify pests. So, that uh, it's very important that the collection uh, continues to grow. Um, so the fireflies or the, uh, the official Latin name is Lampiridae. 
which was described by the uh, Raffinesque in 1815. And most of us know them as these flying insects uh, that um, emit light at night, which not all of them do, but most of them do. And they are known under many different names in the world. So um, here in the US, mostly as fireflies or as lightning bugs. And it depends, I guess, on the area where you live, which name is used. Um, but they have very interesting names all around the world. Like um, one of my favorite ones is La Bette uh, de Feu, which kind of means beast of fire. And that's like used on some of the islands in the West Indies. And then, but glowworm is very, very often used because a lot of the females um, never fly. They look like kind of like glowing worms. So that where that name comes from, but they all have their little um, weird names all, all over the world. They all have their little um, stories where so in some countries people are afraid of them. And they think that a firefly, which is often seen on uh, near cemeteries because of the habitat there with lots of trees, some uh, water sources around. And a lot of people sometimes think that they're actually souls leaving the bodies. Um, so that's in a few countries in the world. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the life cycle. So what a lot of people might not know is that a lot of the life stages, which is a life, uh, life stages are the egg, the larvae, pupa, and then the adults, but the eggs actually glow. And as far as we know, they do that for every species of firefly. So here's a species from, um, this is Luciola cardiana from Taiwan. And you can see here, they uh, were breeding them in the lab and they collected all these eggs and you can see it like they glow. Then the next life stage is the larva. And this, uh, this is a larvae, I'm not sure which species that is, but you can see at the uh, tail end um, of, of the larva, you have see, so you see these uh, glowing spots. And as far as we know, again, all larvae have the ability to produce light. And they most likely do this to warn predators that they do not taste well. So by glowing, they tell any kind of predator that wants to eat them that uh, I don't taste well, please don't eat me. Um, that's mostly the reason that we think they glow. And sometimes there is a hypothesis that they glow to actually um, get uh, prey for themselves to lure that in. And firefly larvae eat, they're actually predators. So they eat snails, they eat slugs, they eat earthworms, and sometimes other things too when they find them dead. But this is a firefly larva that is actually eating the, um, a, a snail. And a lot of the firefly larvae have these really like pointy heads and pointy pronota that are specialized to go into the snail shell. And so they can fit in there and uh, actually eat snails. The next life stage is the pupa for holometabolous insects. And as you can see here again, as far as you know, all the pupa can produce light, um, especially when irritated. And this is again, a warning sign like to, um, a message that they're not tasting good and do not be eaten. Um, and then the last life stage is the adult. On the left side, that is a more typical adult. This is a male of the species Phosis reticulata, which we have in um, Florida. Very rarely seen, but this is more like a species that's known from North Carolina and Tennessee. It's called the blue ghost. And I have a couple of pictures later on in the talk to show you why it's called that. And on the right side, that is actually a female. That is not a larva. That is a female of this species. She is kind of what we call larvae form. She does not have wings, so she can't fly. And this, she like lives in the um, low grass and there she glows. And then she uh, communicates with the males and with the glowing and with the signaling to um, lure the, or the, to get the males to fly to her and uh, for mating. And so this is also why it's very important when you go out to collect ins uh, to look at fireflies, to stay on your path, to not go off into the grasses because that's where the females are. And you might uh, step on some of these females while walking around 
um, looking for fireflies. So if you go into the woods or so, and there's a path, please stay on the path. And so to protect um, fireflies and um, other insects as well. This is another female firefly from Asia in the genus Lampagera, and you can see they get pretty big. So the, this is one probably of the biggest species of fireflies, and they get about, I would say, five to six centimeters long in the wild. And it's quite the show when those guys uh, crawl towards you. Or so they're actually, for some reason, attracted to lights at night and sometimes come crawling towards you. And they have this continuous glow. And when they crawl towards you, you see these two lights kind of like crawling towards you. It's kind of, it's really cool. Um, so fireflies as adults flash for different reasons. So what we think there's mostly three reasons. Again, one uh, is the same as with larvae to, and pupa, is to signal that they do not taste well, uh, good. And so they uh, flash because of that. And then basically for reproduction. So they all, every species of firefly, and there's um, currently about 2,400 species. Actually, there's 2,401 actually since today. Today came a paper out that raised the number of fireflies to 2,401 in about 145 genera. And every species that glows, not all of them do, about probably 80% of them um, flash as adults, but there's about 20% of fireflies that do not light, uh, use light signals at all. But as far as we know, every single one of these firefly species has their own flash signal. And here on the left, um, of your screen, you can see a picture and you see there's nine numbers. So there's nine different species of fireflies and their flash signal, how they do. So that some of them blink continuously like with the same regular um, interval. Some of them blink really fast, really fast and then have a long um, um, pause and then flash again. Some of them make these more elongated flashes. Some of them make wiggly flashes like number four. And some of them, if you're trained and you know your species, you can go out at night, you can identify firefly species based on their flashback. Um, it takes a lot of practice. I can do probably a few of them, but not a lot of them. But I will talk a little bit about that later with uh, when I talk about another firefly researcher here from Florida, Jim Lloyd, who died a couple of years ago, but he spent about almost 60 years studying fireflies and especially a long time here in Florida. But you can uh, go outside and see these like this. Um, I'm, I have to see which is it. I'm. I think it's number. Maybe it's number four or so. That that like that signal that looks like a J. That is uh, North America's most well-known firefly species, um, Photinus perellus, or people call it the Big Dipper. But it makes this J motion, and they start low on the ground. They make a J. They go a little bit up, then they fly parallel to the ground, and then they make another J. And that keeps on going until they reach about um, the tree heights, uh, the tree tops, and then they stop. And that's how they uh, try to communicate with the females to find a female. Then there's also these tw about 20% of species that do not signal with um, flashes, and they usually live during the day. This is one um, that does this. This is Terotus. Uh, Toroto species from California, and you can see these really elaborate antennae. And they use these elaborate antennae to smell um, chemicals that the females emit, and they can find each other using these chemicals. And then there is the intermittent uh, ones that have really elaborate antennae, but they still do flash, and they use flash communication for long distance, and then they use um, pheromones and chemical communication for um, the short distance to find each other. This is a list from, um, I think, 1995 of the firefly species of Florida. This was um, produced by Jim Lloyd. We are currently working on a updated version of the book, which deals with um, a list of beetles of Florida. And um, I am working on the list of uh, fireflies that are currently now in the state. And we have just around 60 species, which is 
probably in rivalry with Georgia for which state has the most species. We might be up right now. So I think Florida currently has the most species of fireflies in the US. And this is um, basically due because of Jim Lloyd who published a book that I will talk later about on, uh, on the Futurus uh, genus of fireflies, which he studied for over 50 years. And he described 30 new species in his book and a lot of them are actually Florida endemic species that only can be found either in Florida. Sometimes they cross over into Georgia. But I will talk about that book a little in a little bit. And now I'm just gonna show you a few species that I think are quite interesting for um, Florida. Um, and that are easy to find for you guys. Um, not all of them are flashing, but our Fl um, Florida firefly season is also very different from the rest of the continental states. So our firefly season starts in about late March for some species and then goes into possibly early, uh, late uh, May or early June. And then we kind of stop for the summer. And then we have another in late August to early September where a couple of species come out again. In the rest of the US, the main firefly uh, season is basically June, maybe early, uh, uh, late May, but mainly June and July and uh, August. Uh, but a lot of these species do not occur in uh, Florida or are rarely seen like this uh, on, in the middle screen under Photinus, there is Photinus borealis, the most well-known. This is the species that everyone says, I see hundreds or thousands of them when they're up north. We have this in the, in the state, but it's very rarely found and the uh, populations are not quite as big as um, they are just in Northern Georgia or um, Tennessee or so. This is actually a picture that I took last year. This is in Gainesville. This is in um, Sweetwater, not the preserve, but just north that little, um, the little woods that you can walk through to get on the Hawthorne Trail. This is um, the firefly species Futurus uh, congener. And this is a picture that uh, I took about probably 40 pictures and laid them over each other. So there is a really nice amount of fireflies in Sweetwater, but not quite as many as you see on the picture. But you can do these, this delayed photography with like seven second exposures that then you can see um, the travel, the way the fireflies travel. Like you can see some of these lines, that's the way they flash while they're travel while the males fly around. And there's just a couple more pictures that I took. And this is about to start. I think um, there are few fireflies out already. They usually, the peak of these guys is going to be in a week or two. Uh, depends, it's always depending on the temperatures uh, during the winter, um, how warm it got and stuff. The, the uh, rains we had lately, the really bad rains, um, they might delay their emergence a little bit, but um, I would think in a couple of weeks, you're gonna be able to see fireflies here uh, in Sweetwater. You can go to some of the lakes around here and they will be out in uh, fairly decent numbers. Um, especially this species is uh, comes out in bigger numbers and it kind of sometimes drowns out the other species because there's just so many and a lot. And uh, Jim Lloyd speculated that some of these species actually, some of the other species actually then delay their emergence to not have to compete with um, these guys. And so this is now a few species that are here in the state. This is Lucidota luticalis. Um, it was just by the, inter uh, by the IUCN, it was just regulate, um, put out that this species might be endangered. It is known from about eight or nine counties in Florida and it needs a very, sandy habitat in like the Centra uh, habitats and they fly on sunny days, they fly above the sand areas and the females are actually flightless and they are in the sand. So the males look for the females in the sand and then they will land a mate. But these, this firefly is not flashing, it is day active. And 
you can see it in some of these sandy areas when that when the males are out there's like dozens possibly more uh, hundreds or so out flying above these um, sandy habitats this one is one of the cooler fireflies i think in um, florida it's mostly in northern florida so from gainesville up north to the Georgia border in the panhandle, Paula classes by Faria. And when you look at the antennae, it has very elaborate antennae. And so this is also day active. And um, the females are actually, they can actually also fly. And so you can find these um, during the day in more woody areas in the underbrush. Um, they're hard to see. Usually when I find them, I, um, I find them by um, sweeping my net, and uh, we'll catch them that way. Micronaspis floridana is a species that you find in the salt marshes around the coasts of Florida. Um, my first time I saw it, this was in Cedar Key. Um, and I think that's also the location it was first found and described from. And it's a really nice looking firefly. It's, um, it was until recently the only firefly in, its, in the genus. Um, they have just found another one that also has uh, lives the, li uh, the life history of living in, in these salt marshes. And when you go looking at them in like in Cedar Key, um, you have to be very careful because they're like these habitats in the salt marshes where you have these, I can't remember what they're called, but these um, plants that are, that are very sharp. And so when you bend down, you might poke your eye out. So that's how it's the only habitat I've ever found them in. And, but you can see the larvae that glow and these guys glow as well. And they fly over, over the marshes when you can see that key where that little area is where you have the walkway and you can be on the walkway and watching these guys fly around. And um, these guys are actually around all year long as far as I know, and you can see them, but they're out currently as well if you uh, want to make a little trip to see that key. This is Fossus reticulata. I showed it to you earlier. This is called the blue ghost. Um, on the bottom, you see this picture. So this firefly actually glows continuously and just rarely turns the light off. But when you make this long exposure photography, you get these streaks of light. And some people, um, I do not perceive this light as blue. I see like more, more like yellow greenish light when I see them. And I was lucky enough to see them last year in Tennessee, but um, some people perceive it as blue and that's why it's called the blue ghost. And it's very eerie when they, when you see them and like if you're at the, at the cemetery and you see them, it's very kind of like ghostly. And that's why people um, call, called it that. And there's a currently a version of the genus underway and there's a lot more species than we actually thought in this genus. And, a lot of them are in the Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina area. This is Aspizoma ignita, which this is a firefly that only got introduced or that the, we don't know when it got introduced, but the first time we actually found it was about 2002. And it's in down in Miami in uh, Dade County and um, my, uh, Miami Dade County and the other and a couple of the other counties around and then the Keys. And this is a interesting case of humans bringing fireflies around. So this firefly originated in probably South America, but it's currently known from every single island of the bigger islands in the West Indies. And now finally has also made it into um, Florida and also traveled all the way through um, Central America and it's also in Texas. So this firefly can be found in Texas and in Florida. And we think it, the larvae travel with wood or firewood or so, and that early humans have brought it through the islands when they settled on, on all the islands. And then um, possibly storms like hurricanes may have brought it into uh, Florida because they're not very good flyers. So they needed some help to get into Florida. Um, so this, I don't know, some of you might have known him. I don't, he may have been active in the Audubon Society in Alachua County, but this is, oh, this was Jim Lloyd. He was an emeritus, emeritus professor at UF when I started, and I had lunch with him um, throughout the later years almost every day, and he shared a lot of his 
firefly knowledge with me. And this is him with one of his inventions. He took these um, fishing poles and attached an LED light on them and an on, off, an on and off button. And he would go out in the field and use this to lure in fireflies. So he would mimic their flash pattern, which he was an expert on and would lure fireflies in to him. And they would come and land on his um, shirt or so. And he would also travel the, um, the country going to give talks and presentations at university. And he would do the same thing in lecture halls by having someone release fireflies on the back, he would signal them and they would come towards him and land on his shirt. And he was an expert on all these flash patterns of all these North American species and how they would change with temperature and all these things. And he was also, when he was a grad student at Cornell, he was the one that found this phenomena, phenomena where these fireflies in the genus Futurus actually hunt other fireflies in the genera Paractomina and Photinus to eat them. And they eat them because they want these leucopophagins, which are the chemicals that protect fireflies. They can, apparently the females cannot produce them, so they need to consume them from other fireflies to give them to the eggs when they lay eggs. And this is very interesting to see because they do this by mimicking the flash patterns of other species. So these females don't only have their own flash pattern to mate with the males, they can mimic the flash patterns of certain species that are in the same habitat, in the same area as them and lure them in. And that's how they, this um, on the bottom right, this female got this little uh, male Photinus species and he or she's um, starting to eat him. This is his book and I copied the link. If anybody wants the link later, I can um, um, give it to you in the, in the chat. And this book is free. Um, it was only published in paper and for about, I think 30 or 40 um, copies that were given to libraries, uh, university libraries and a few of his friends. And, but the book, which is an amazing book of about four, 500 pages, and you can read anything about every species of Futurus in the Eastern US with flash pattern analysis, with life history, with stories about his life. He was, an, he was a very interesting scientific writer, not the more like, you know, very precise writing that we prefer in science, but he kind of like was more like a storyteller. And if you're interested in fireflies of the general Futurus, Paractomina, and a couple other species, this is definitely a nice book to read. And again, it's free as a PDF online. And I will give the link in um, the chat in a little bit. And it has really all these really cool um, pictures in it. And this is just a collection of pictures of Futurus fireflies and the fireflies they caught to eat. And Jim observed them for 50 years and he collected all these um, specimens and then made them available to study for later people that want to study this, uh, this uh, life history and they can have it. And you can see a couple of these pictures, like picture O has like the parts of the firefly that the firefly already had um, taken apart. And it's just a really nice legacy that he left behind at the University of Florida and in the collection there that we can study. Um, there's also at the end of the book is this guide to how go out into the field and how to observe these flash patterns and how to measure them with a, with a um, stopwatch. And so you can actually identify the different species. And um, it also is important what the temperature outside is. So you need, usually need a thermometer to make sure what kind of temperature is because flashes, flash patterns get faster the warmer it is. So there's a lot of stuff to, um, consider when you do this. And I have to admit, I can do it probably for two or three species and I'm really not good at the rest. So it takes a long time to learn uh, how, to ex how to identify these in the field. And it's, it, it's a shame that Jim died and that we lost, like he was more a true naturalist than he was maybe an academic, but he could just teach everyone so much about it. And I learned a lot about fireflies from him. 
So now I'm gonna switch a little bit to giving you some tips about what we can do to help fireflies. And one of the biggest things that makes problems is artificial light at night. And this actually is artificial light is any light that is produced by humans that, that we have started, like you can see here on the top left is um, stadiums, any kind of sports stadiums that are constantly lit. On the right, you have um, pla plants like um, here's an oil factory that's burning oil. On the bottom left, you have, you have all these street lights everywhere and they're constantly on during the night. And then of course we have houses and all our you know, additional lighting, like here this house has a lot of spotlights to shine on uh, either the gardening or on the walls so you can see it better. And then these are all produced by us, by humans, and they're all bad for insects. And I'm sure you have, this is another picture you can see on the left is the house. If there's no light on on the outside, just the internal lights. And then on the right, you have one or two spotlights on the garage that can completely change how much light is emitted and how um, the night sky changes. You can see no stars and almost no stars in the sky anymore because of one light. And this I'm sure is a familiar picture to all of you. Uh, you have your lights on outside your house or um, on street lights. Insects fly to lights. They get confused because a lot of species that fly at night use the moon or the stars or mainly the moon for um, orientation and what they do. And when they get light, um, artificial light, the light source is much closer. So they fly towards this light source and then they get close and then they start flying in circles. And the problem is a lot of these insects then exhaust themselves and a lot of them die. Um, there's studies out that say that 50 to 60% of these uh, insects that fly around at night uh, during lights and gas stations so that they die because they exhaust uh, themselves and they um, cannot fly away when the lights actually go out. This is just a picture to show you what has happened in the US in the late uh, last 70 years. Um, these are pictures taken at, light, uh, at night by um, from the sky and you can see how much more artificial light, how populations have grown, how much more bigger cities uh, have developed. And on the bottom right, there is a little um, study that they think this is how it's going to look in 2025. So there's a real big difference just from 1997 to 2025, especially in the Eastern US. So the Western US is not quite as um, populated. So, but in the Eastern US, you can see that there will be almost no spot without light pollution left. Um, this is actually from 2020, um, a more updated one. And you can see all the big cities, all the big uh, population hubs and how light is distributed. And you can see lights on the big roads. You can actually see all the highways that um, go through the US. And this is Florida in 2012. And this is Florida and I go back and forth so 2012 and 2020, so even just in these eight years, the light pollution has really taken off. And you can see some like, you know, in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, how even going into the ocean, how light pollution has get, gotten worse. And so there's little habitat left for fireflies or for any wildlife to be undisturbed now. And all these light, this light pollution really messes with reproduction of fireflies because their light, their signals get drowned out by light. So it's really bad. So these are suggestions to reduce um, artificial light at night. And this, this is, was presented by a group um, based uh, from um, the Boston area where they study a lot of the problems that arise from all these light sources. And I have a paper and a couple of names later on to show you, but if you're interested to read up a little more on that, but they present really good evidence what's going on. So turn off your unnecessary lights at night. Um, do you need your door light outside after you go to bed or, you know, or your garage light? Can you turn that off possibly and reduce light pollution? 
You can also install motion activated lights that automatically turn off. Then you don't have to um, actually um, think about it or timers and stuff that, you know, your lights turn on when it gets dark and turn off like at 11 or so. Um, and then maybe with motion activated on top. So you don't um, have them on a light or all night. Um, use fixtures that direct light and really like the desired places you want to light up. Um, a lot of times we don't have light fixtures that do that. So your light kind of goes everywhere, but you can really use these directed light fixtures to light up the areas that around the house or around your driveway so that you actually really want to light up. And then use light bulbs with different colors. So there is ongoing light uh, research on what light actually possibly affects uh, wildlife, especially specifically fireflies, um, less than others. Um, so in Taiwan, there was some research done. There is a wavelength of red, reddish, that is um, affects fireflies less than others. So they there are parks that are completely outfitted with these light bulbs to um, not affect fireflies as much. And, it's a real attraction. There's um, a firefly, a park in the middle of Taipei where thousands of people go every night to see fireflies and they are very active because uh, they have less disturbance in the habitat uh, because of it, because of these light bulbs. So these are a few things you, people can think about and maybe change to help fireflies find uh, mates and uh, disturb them less but also this is you know works for every single other insect by not attracting them into your to your light sources then uh so, so this is a paper by Avalon Owens she just uh, defended her PhD at Tufts University um, this past week and she did a lot of research on this light pollution and how it affects insects but also very specifically how it affects a few of the firefly species up there. And um, I can also, if you have questions, give you more links to these papers. And so they have a list of all the things that harm insects because of light pollution and what kind of insect is um, being um, um, affected. And, you know, they get affected by for development, movement, foraging, reproduction, and predation. So there's a wide range of things that happen to these insects, to all kinds of insects. Um, and we can help that by just limiting um, light pollution a little bit. Then how can you help fireflies yourself if you live in the countryside? Don't rake your leaves or leave some leaf litter around um, you know, the, your tree bases on the edges of your property um, because that's where a lot of insects develop like the larvae of fireflies. They are hunting, leaf, uh, they're hunting snails and slugs and earthworms. So leaf litter is very important for them because it's also moist habitat. So if you can leave some areas or specify an area in your yard that you don't rake, um, it really helps uh, fireflies and other insects as well. Avoid the use of pesticides. Um, if you want a wildlife friendly yard, you should avoid them um, if as much as possible, of course. But that's a big one because, you know, you spray pesticides to get rid of your cockroaches or your fire ants, but the problem is the other insects get you know, affected by that too. So if you can limit that, it's also a good uh, thing. Install water features on your property, like little ponds or um, stuff like that, uh, which helps. I understand that Florida or most places have mosquito problems. So um, moving water is probably uh, better or you have to, you know, take care a little bit about, you know, mosquito lava and watch that, what's going on. Maybe have some fish in there that can eat the um, mosquito larvae, but fireflies like um, moist, um, wet habitats. So having like a little uh, stream or so, or a pond uh, 
is good for their development. And again, there's will be snails and slugs in that, those habitats, so more food for them. And then last, um, don't mow as often if you can, if, and especially in the spring. So the spring is when a lot of these insects get active again, the, the larvae or even the pupa that have overwintered, they get active again. And if you mow, you, you know, kill them or you harm them and you also remove again, you remove all the leaf litter, all the, all the extra um, protection that they have. So if you can mow less or leave certain areas in your yard, again, go like longer for a certain amount of time, that will help fireflies development. And especially if you're a little bit outside of Gainesville, fireflies in Gainesville are kind of like, they are here, but mostly in these, in the parks or so. So there's not many neighborhoods where you're gonna have fireflies in your yard. Um, so, but if you can do this and you are bordering one of the parks or so, you can possibly get some fireflies in your yard as well. And with that, um, I will take questions. And this is a picture I took in um, Tennessee last year. And this is actually less pictures than the one in, in Gainesville. And there's just so many more um, member uh, fireflies out just because they have different species and they're just more active. And this is like in, in, in the um, Smoky Mountains and there's just, it's an amazing thing to see. And if you can ever go up to uh, the Smokies and see the synchronized fireflies or so, I would highly recommend doing that. It's, it's, it's amazing to just sit in the woods and just have thousands of fireflies start flashing next to you and all continuously they stop. This is the synchronized part is they're not them flashing, but the stopping. All the males stop flashing to see if the females are answering. You have these like four or five seconds of complete darkness around you before they start flashing again. So with that, I will take questions. Um, I typed it in the chat, but uh, y'all can, uh, you're now unable to unmute yourselves. Uh, so you can uh, directly ask Oliver any questions. Thanks. I will um, stop sharing. Okay. Let's see. Um, in the chat, uh, Deborah asked, um, you may have already covered this, but are these fireflies distasteful to predators? And is there a mimicry complex around them? Um, yes, they are distasteful. So if you, if you were to put one on your lip, your lip would go numb and it tastes really bad. Um, there's some studies out where they tested this where bats would catch, a, naive bat would catch a firefly, they would taste them and then they would spit them out. And the second time they would see one flashing, they would just abort the mission and not even go and eat them anymore um, because they learned that um, they taste bad. Frogs, on the other hand, will eat them several times because apparently their memory is very short term <laughs> and they will forget and they will go for a firefly again after a few hours because, you know, it, let's see how that tastes again. Um, but yes, um, they are, and there's mimicry complexes. Um, there's several beetles, there's several other insects that have these usually very um, orange black warning colors. Um, there's lysids, there's all kinds of other, there's longhorn beetles that mimic them. Um, there's moth and cockroaches that mimic fireflies. Um, we don't know if those are chemically protected or not, but um, yes, there is definitely uh, some of these um, mimicry okay. rings. Um, there's a question by Karen. Uh, I think it's a combination why they have disappeared a little more than also the droughts. Like the few years ago, we had all these years of drought, right? And I want to say the last couple of years, firefly populations have gone up again. There's a lot more out than there were like five years ago because it was so dry. Um, these droughts really affect firefly larvae because they need this moist habitat. So the populations probably went down a little bit, but they're going up again. 
reinducing them to an area, yes, possible. it is possible. It would take a very big effort from a lot of people, I think. Not, I'm not sure if one could do it by themselves. I mean, you could go and catch them and release them and hope they would stay. But I know in Taiwan, this one, fire, this one park in the middle of the city had no fireflies left. They went and took part of the park. They took all the invasive plants out. They made um, ponds and everything, and then introduced fireflies. They reared in the lab at the university, and the fireflies have established again in the middle of the city. But they also made the, the park firefly friendly with all these light sources. So it is possible, but it would take a bigger effort. And um, But yes, it is definitely possible. Um, uh, Tina said they had around 250 fireflies in their yard. Yes, last year was a really good year. We had nice um, wet winter, I'd say, uh, and wet spring, and fireflies were record numbers, like really nice numbers in Florida, but not only in Florida, but everywhere across the US. I follow a naturalist a lot, and there were just amazing uh, observations of firefly from everywhere and um, a little earlier than usual and just really nice numbers and um, so yes last year was a good year and I, I assume this year will be a good year as well. Um, do mosquito donuts or dunks harm fireflies or other beetles? I'm not quite sure what that is but I would think yes. <laughs> um, any pesticides, any like poison they may say it's very targeted on mosquitoes, but there's usually some other insects that are affected by them. I mean, they can really not target them that precise to do that. So yes, if you have that, it might be um, a problem. Any other questions? Um, Deborah had asked, uh, where in the Smokies, um, or you, you, you mentioned some in the Smokies. Um. Yeah, there is a, if you Google um, uh, Oh God, <laughs> forgot the word. Uh, synchronous fireflies, you would come up there. Is, um, it's, in the, it's, it's in the national park. You actually have to win the lottery. You have to apply to a lottery and you have to win the lottery to be able to actually go. Um, they make it, it's a two week, um, event because they can they can predict based on water uh, water um, water uh, rainfall and based on temperatures they predict what is the peak two weeks for these fireflies and then they have the lottery and then they invite people to the national park to see this and it's very regulated because they don't want people go off the go off the path and you know step on them and so so it's very regulated. Um, I was lucky because I went to a photography workshop that I got to see them because even though I know these people, I do not get preferential treatment. And it's really like, it's, it's really a luck thing that they only let like, gosh, 1200 cars and 500 RVs or so into this park during this certain era, uh, timeline. But they're very good at predicting when these guys peak based on 100 years of uh, data, rainfall data and other data that they have. So they're really good at it. So when they advertise it, it's usually you get to see them. Uh, William? Yeah, Oliver, do you know if um, the, any of the female sex attractant pheromones have been, the structures have been elucidated? Um, I'm not sure if any of the US species have done that, but I would have to look, but I'm fairly sure someone in Asia, in Taiwan in particular has done it because they're very active on these um, behavior uh, and ecology studies. So, but I cannot think of a single study that has done that, the chemicals for the US. They have looked at the chemicals that protect fireflies and leucopophagians. They have been um, studied, but you need a lot of specimens to actually do that, to be put them in the, kill them, and then put the chemicals on the mass spec to actually get a result. So, and it seems like there's very, a lot of different leucopophagians in different species that protect them. Yeah. Um, but I don't think anybody has looked at the pheromones and um, 
especially in some of these cool species from uh, California, because they don't have any flowing adult species in California or the West Coast. So it's interesting that no one has looked at them. But yeah, the big antennae and stuff, that would be cool to look at and what they're, what they're actually doing. Yes. Yeah. Are there any books on the fireflies of Costa Rica? Are there books? Yeah, or any anything. We're, uh, we're doing interestingly, some Interestingly, considering that Costa Rica is, is one nicely studied country for most uh, animals, there is not anything. So south of Mexico, there's not a single country in Central America that has a list, even a list of species. Um, I am currently working on finishing the world catalog that has a distribution or country distribution list. Um, so I could give you a list of species that have been historically published on from Costa Rica, but um, I'm not sure how good that list is. And I'm assuming there is probably dozens and dozens of new species that are not described in Costa Rica. Yeah. Is your email uh, on the UF website? Uh, I'm not at UF. I'm... Um, no, but you were. I was wondering if, if you still have a UF email. I do. Um, it's O. Keller. Okay. Uh, at ufl.edu. But okay, I'm not sure so if they still have it on the website. Yeah. I'll send you an email. When does firefly season start in this area? Um, right it now. It started. <laughs> it started in my house. The last few days. Um, it's. I'm assuming the rain uh, may have delayed it a little bit, the heavy rains we had. Uh, in the last week or so, but yes, they are starting to come out. Um, probably Sweetwater, any of the lakes around here probably will be first. Um, some of the parks, like the one on uh, what's that, 34th and 8th, um, that area, they're probably out. Um, but peak will be in a week or two. How long? Predict. Maybe. Um, it's, it's hard to predict because we don't have a lot of uh, historical data on this. Um, they're much better on that in the, in the Smokies and stuff, but uh, it would be nice for like, you know, parks, national, uh, not national parks, state parks to kind of like note down when first flyflies are seen and make that, like, you know, make this data available. But you know, we don't have that very uh, much right now. And there's a firefly festival down in, um, oh God, just north of, uh, north of Orlando where Stetson University is. I can't think of the right name right now, but they had, they are having currently a firefly festival where they open the state park, I believe, for to go in and um, they have guided tours, I believe. And a lot of times you want guided tours so people, you know, watch out where they're going and don't disturb the populations. Kind of like our uh, field trips with uh, Henslow Sparrows. Yeah. Oh, so, um, you, you mentioned, uh, you could you drop a link to um, uh, Jim Lloyd's uh, book? Yes. Just a second. Um, um, just a second. Oops. And do um, have you noticed? Uh, is there a lot of, uh, of, of like an increase in our uh, an improvement or increase in our understanding of um, like distribution of fireflies with um, iNaturalist and um, yes, I, it's, it's, I, it's as bad as the pandemic was, the pandemic has really helped iNaturalist. I mean, observations have just gone crazy on those, on those pages uh, because everyone had a lot more time. Everyone went out in nature and uh, observed these things. And also the IUCN um, is actually, we have a firefly, uh, firefly working group and we are currently evaluating all the US species for how endangered they are. And there are all these uh, reports being published on, uh, on this. And you can find those online if you go to IUC, IUCN and look for fireflies. Yeah, Steel End, that's where the Firefly Festival, um, festival currently is. And um, so there is, um, there is that, but all these reports sometimes lag because they don't get in touch with museums like us and they might have some data, but they don't have complete data. So they might say something is endangered, but we have a lot more data that they're much more um, 
around like um, Lucy Dorda, Lucy, Lucy Collis, they only had records for four, five counties, I think. But when I looked in our collection, we had like nine or 10 counties overall that where they were found. So um, sometimes these, this data is like very, you know, even I, I naturalist, you know, you only have good data in places where people go out and a lot of people go out. But that sometimes is, um, doesn't show the whole picture and you might get a wrong idea on what, where something actually is. And fireflies are very hard to identify based on pictures. Um, this, the genus Futurus can only identify it alive based on flash patterns. You cannot identify them based on a picture or as a specimen that's dead in a museum. So if we, if I have a whole drawer of Futurus, they're not identified to species based on a flash pattern, I can only say they're Futurus. I cannot tell you what species there is and no one in this world can. Not even Jim Lloyd, he, could, he couldn't do it either. So that's a problem. Um, insects, like, you know, birds, you identify them based on a picture is, the, the likelihood of that being right is very high. In insects, it is possibly not, depending on how many species you have around that kind of look the same. So, yes. Sweet. Um, I, had, I had a question about um, like each firefly. I mean, I'm sure they're not all the same, of course, but um, how much, like how widely does one individual like range, you know, like how much habitat does it need to be successful? They're not very good flyers. They fly, but they're not long distance flyers. So a firefly that's in Sweetwater Park will probably stay in Sweetwater Park. It will not tra uh, go into another um, neighboring um, woodland or something like that. I, that's very unlikely. Um, they only live a few, like a month or two as adults. Um, they live one to two years as uh, larvae, but as adults, yeah, they're not very good flyers. And especially if the male flies away, the females can't do the same transfer to another habitat because they can't fly in, in some cases. So it would be evolutionary bad for a male to actually go into a different habitat. Um, a lot of times, I think fireflies, when they move in different habitats where they've never been seen, probably had some humans uh, responsible for that. Or mm -hmm. sometimes storms. I mean, storms have brought insects into Florida, like these hurricanes from islands that possibly couldn't have, couldn't have done it themselves, but they could have possibly, you know, blown over from Hispaniola on, into the Keys and then possibly established there. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. Anyone have anyone else have any questions? Um, do you mention that uh, the town above Stetson University is Deland? Yeah, that's uh, where the park is. I mean, this might be the last weekend for them, but um, that seems to be a very good park to see fireflies as well. Awesome. All right. Well, unless we have any uh, uh, pending, no more questions. Um, um, again, just uh, from the announcements, we have several events coming up, Wednesday wetland walks, um, looking for volunteers for uh, upcoming uh, festivals for Elijah Audubon uh, ed inf uh, educational booth um, and a few other things. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much, Oliver. This was uh, outstanding. It's, you know, I, I always really enjoy the non-birding uh, 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 programs, uh, non, not bird related. It's, you know, the, we had a great one about bees a few months ago. So that, right in the vein with, you know, right in the vein with that. Um, it's, this was just outstanding. Um, and we really appreciate you uh, 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 speaking to us this evening. It was um, extremely, extremely informational. And um, uh, We'll be posting this on, uh, again, we'll be posting this on our website, um, on social media. Uh, so uh, if anyone missed it, um, I'll be sharing those links here soon. Um, but thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right, y'all. Well, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, close this meeting down. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for tonight's uh, Elijah Audubon evening program. Uh, with Oliver Keller. Um, great presentation on fireflies. And uh, we'll see y'all next time. Thank you so much, Oliver. And thank you everyone who joined us. Thank you.